So on behalf of my co-trustees at NIF, Neer Jajayal and Srinath Raghavan, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the 15th New India Foundation Lecture. Thank you all for coming. NIF was set up 20 years ago by our now emeritus trustees, Nanda Nilakani and Ramchandra Goha, to basically encourage um, writing and thinking about post-1947 India. We do four things. We give a year-long fellowship to write books, and we've got 32 books published. Two more will be out this year, 20 more in the next few years. Second is we offer translation fellowships for books in English from 10 Indian languages. Our first three books in Bangla, Karnataka, and Marathi have recently found publishers and will be out next year. Third, we run a book prize called the, uh, named after Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay for the best nonfiction book about modern India. This year, we will choose our sixth winner and announce it at the Bangalore Lit Fest. And of course, we have the NIF lecture named after Girish Karnad, renamed after Girish Karnad in 2019 to honor the great playwright's memory and legacy. All of we're in Bangalore. He lived and worked here. His contribution to Kannada literary culture has been immense, and he had a spectacular acting and directing career. Girish's memoir, This Life at Play, which he jointly translated from Kannada with Srinath Perur, was published in 2021, and I would recommend it. It's a wonderful read, and we have Saras here today. This year's Girish Karnad Memorial Lecture is delivered by Amory Lev Lovins. He's a physicist, a writer whose pioneering work has recalibrated how we view clean energy and sustainable development. Lovins is the co-founder and chairman emeritus of the Rocky Mountain Institute, an independent, non-partisan, non-profit organization that works to transform the global energy system to secure a clean, prosperous, and zero carbon future. He has written 31 books and 800 papers, including Natural Capitalism, Reinventing Fire, and Winning the Oil End Game. Time has named him one of the world's most 100 influential people, and one of his preferred introductions is a winner of the MacArthur Genius Award, as one from amongst many other honors, including the Blue Planet, Volvo, Zayed, Onassis, Nissan, Hapold, 12 honorary doctorates, Heinz, Lindbergh, Right Livelihood, or the Alternative Nobel National Design and World Technology Awards. He's a proponent of integrative design and Taoism. Lovins believes that the laws of nature can help us build more harmoniously. His own home office in Colorado has a 900 square feet banana farm inside it. A Harvard and Oxford dropout, he has taught at 10 universities, but he only teaches subjects that he hasn't formally studied, so that he can retain the beginner's mind or child's mind, as derived from Eastern traditions, opening himself up to new ideas by shedding all assumptions and preconceptions as a consistent method of learning. The floor is yours, sir. Telling uh, Nanda earlier, I buried more dead mics than an Irish undertaker. Uh, well, welcome to our little adventure together, and thank you so much uh, to the sponsors and organizers. Uh, let me start with a broad conclusion. You, you all know that climate science models conservatively understate the speed and the runaway potential of climate change. But you might not know that models of climate choices and consequences, at least as conservatively, understate what we can do to slow or stop and or reverse climate change. Offsetting these two contrary biases, the race of our lives, the race for our lives, is very much on. It is our race to win. And despair and complacency are equally unwarranted. Today I'll explore some of these omitted climate mitigation opportunities where taking them up could also strengthen India's security, prosperity, equity, health, and development. Some of the biggest missing opportunities start with super efficient energy use, especially of electricity because it leverages the biggest savings in carbon and money. Efficiency and timely energy use and then leverage renewable and distributed supply and grid integration expands renewables, creating the best and cheapest portfolio of options. Together, these innovations could make India's climate solutions much bigger, faster, more profitable than many people suppose. But 
This takes a different and actually a very old way of thinking. One of my mentors, the inventor Edwin Land, founder of Polaroid, said people who seem to have had a new idea have often just stopped having an old idea. That, of course, is the hard part, as many Asian traditions urge, cultivating beginner's mind, original mind, child mind, and opening yourself to new ideas by letting go of all assumptions and preconceptions. So in that spirit, to arrange our metal furniture a bit, uh, rearrange it, help us all get reminded, let's start with a little metal calisthenic I learned from the late great Caltech engineer, Professor Paul McCready, and textbooks on creative thinking have had this for decades. It's called the nine dots problem. And it's normally framed as find the solution that will connect these nine dots with just four lines without lifting your pen from the paper. So let's see, we can try one, two, <coughs> can't move this in a straight line, three, four, five, that doesn't go to work. Hmm. We could try diagonally, one, two, that's not going to work. And immediately you see you need five lines rather than four until you think outside the box, which is the origin of that phrase. And then one day, Paul said, the professor came into the classroom a bit irked because one of his students had just said she'd figured out how to solve this problem in three lines. Well, hmm, four lines was hard enough Dots are infinitely small. Mm, well, wait a minute. These dots are actually rather fat. And maybe we don't have to go right through the center of each dot. So, ah, if your paper's wide enough, you can do this Z trick. <laughs> so seeing that, the students started to feel rather liberated. And you know what happens then. <laughs> they started to find ways to solve this problem with just one line. Uh, there are many one-line solutions. Let me get you started with a few of them. Uh, the Japanese would suggest starting with the origami solution, just fold up the paper until all the points come together in a line. Or if you're a geographer, you might use a very long line. Or if you're a mechanical engineer, a tool-using creature, you could get a tool called a scissors. There was no rule against cutting out the dots. Or if you're a statistician, you can crumple up the paper. And if you stab it over and over again with an, enough times with the pencil, eventually you will go through all nine dots in the same instant. <laughs> and uh, the one I like best came from a nine-year-old girl. Uh, she said, you didn't have to be, say it had to be a thin line. So I used a really thick line. <laughs> So this tyranny of the word the, find the solution with just four lines, put us back in the box and kept us from being more creative in finding more elegantly frugal solutions. So as a prelude to how we can seek the right statement of the design problem, let me introduce what energy efficiency has done and can do when taken to what some might think an extreme, which I would call no longer inadequate, after all, when Edward Land was asked about his famously hard work, he said, anything worth doing is worth doing to excess. And he added that we live in a world changing so rapidly that what we mean frequently by common sense is doing the thing that would have been right last year. Last year's efficiency is already quite outdated. So let us make no little plans and hold no small ambitions. Nearly all the energy people now use is wasted. Now, I'm not referring to saving fossil fuels by substituting electricity or by making it more efficiently by the means shown in three columns starting on the left. At the upper left, thermal power stations, huge conversion losses in red uh, are eliminated at the lower left when renewable electricity uh, uses sun or wind power to make electricity directly without a steam cycle. In the middle column, fuel combustion uh, provides uh, heat several fold less efficiently than a renewably powered heat pump that concentrates uh, free low temperature heat. And then in the right hand column, diesel and petrol engines with their big losses in red are far less efficient than renewably powered motors 
in battery electric vehicles. So the systems in the bottom row, uh, replacing fossil fuels with renewable electricity, are several fold more efficient in turning renewable electricity into delivered services. But this does not yet include higher efficiency in the equipment being powered, or the building or water being heated, or the vehicle being moved. First doing that end use efficiency makes the heat pumps and electric vehicle batteries smaller, cheaper, less mineral intensive. Both kinds of efficiency then multiply to form primary energy efficiency. And by that crude metric, in the past 47 years, saved energy, about two-thirds due to smarter technologies, has dropped U.S. energy use per dollar of GDP by 61 percent, with huge cumulative savings. Renewables, meanwhile, doubled, but with 27 times less cumulative impact. The ratio of headlines and awareness is the opposite, because renewables are visible on the rooftop, on the skyline, whilst energy is invisible and the energy you don't use is almost unimaginable. Yet saved energy is half the world's historic decarbonization and at least half of the future decarbonization. The United States illustrates these longer-term trends in efficiency with major variations between regions. California, for example, has had flat or declining electricity demand for over 30 years, despite and contributing to robust economic growth. But nationwide, back in 1975, our government and industry all insisted that the energy needed to make a dollar of GDP could never go down. A year later, I heretically suggested it could drop 72 percent in the next 50 years. So far, it's dropped 61 percent in 47 years, yet just the innovations made by 2010 can save another threefold, twice what I originally thought, at a third the real cost. And seven years later, that looks conservative. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, that's because optimizing buildings, vehicles, and factories as whole systems, not as piles of isolated parts, can often make very big energy savings cost less than small or no savings, turning diminishing returns into increasing returns. A proven method called integrative design, described in, in a foundational paper, can make energy savings several fold bigger at lower cost by using not more but fewer devices and not fancier but simpler devices, more artfully chosen, combined, timed, and sequenced. We're familiar with resources like metal ore bodies or oil reservoirs, finite and depletable assemblages of atoms. But energy efficiency resources are different. They're infinitely expandable assemblages of ideas, depleting only stupidity, a very abundant resource. Uh, a few examples, integrative design, uh, with the energy performance index in green. Let our Empire State Building retrofit, it's fixing up an old thing, uh, save 38% of its energy, later 43% with a three-year payback. Three years later, our cost-effective retrofit saves 70%, making this half-century old government complex more efficient than what was then the best new U.S. office, which in turn is only a third as efficient as RMI's net positive, no mechanicals, passive office in Basalt, Colorado, near our home, and this southern German building reportedly uses two-fifths less energy still, about as little as an experimental 21, uh, 2021 building I just learned about in Bengaluru. Yet all these technologies existed about two decades ago. What mainly improved is not so much technology as design, how we put the pieces together. Now, in six humid, hot India cities, 15 lakh square meters of integratively designed offices use 80% less energy than the Indian norm, with 10 or 20% lower construction costs, 60% less cooling capacity, and superior comfort and satisfaction. The glare-free daylighting you see in that big floor plate on the right is delivered throughout by contract. If workers complain of glare and demand blinds, then the architect doesn't get paid. These passively cooled mid-rise apartments by architect Ira Thandani, proven popular in Mumbai's monsoon, use convectively vented double walls, and they keep you feeling 11 or 12 degrees cooler, as other traditional techniques can do all over India. 
These buildings had just 2% higher construction cost. With a few further refinements, they could deliver decent comfort with no air conditioning. In Europe, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reported decade-old data showing that the best new buildings on the left and retrofits on the right uh, did a very interesting thing, with both graphs showing bigger savings towards the right and cheaper savings toward the bottom. These diverse buildings could save up to at least 90% of their energy use without costing more per unit of saved energy. Even such huge savings in diverse new and old buildings could be very cheap, nearly down to the horizontal axis if they were integratively designed. The big vertical cost scatter in both graphs just shows the opportunity to conform inferior projects to best practices. Now, how could we make more of this happen faster? Well, a few ideas to encourage developers. Government could raise or lower the floor area ratio based on the measured efficiency of your previous buildings. Or to connect a new building or major renovation to the grid and to other public services like water or sewerage, you could pay a fee or get a rebate, which and how big would depend on how efficiently the building use those, uses those services. And the fees can pay for the rebates. You know, building standards are obsolete before the ink is dry and they give no incentive to do better, but fee baits drive continuous improvement. Design professionals, we found, perform much better if they're rewarded for savings, not for expenditures. Buildings could be labeled with their measured efficiency, just like restaurant health inspections, and local governments could simply allow all super-efficient new buildings to go to the head of the queue for any required approvals. This costs government nothing, but to a developer, time is money. Now, the best air conditioning systems for big Singapore buildings two decades ago were two or three times as efficient as standard Indian practice today, but they worked better and they cost less. Now they're even better, but they may just have become obsolete. Because a 2019 experiment found that purely radiative cooling can keep people comfortable outdoors in Singapore without moving, drying, or cooling the still muggy hot air. Instead, in a shaded but open-ended pavilion, people were cooled entirely by absorbing far infrared radiation from their bodies into vertical panels slightly cooled by water and shielded from the humid air by a thin plastic film. Even at 80% relative humidity, radiant temperatures around 23 to 25 degrees in the panel can <clears throat> deliver comfort in air up to at least 32 degrees. This mild cooling can often be provided passively with no electricity by special radiative surfaces or paints or textiles. This autumn, a Stanford engineering class will seek to design the system so simply that billions of people in tropical slums and apartments can afford it. And in principle, that could about eliminate global growth in peak electricity demand. Nobody had expected this behavior because they hadn't tried the experiment before. Now, what about inside our buildings? Well, this fist-sized fist Swiss heat pump can deliver 6 to 15 units of hot water from one unit of electricity. This dramatically more efficient on the right and safe and superior Swiss electric conduction cooking system uses vacuum-insulated pots and other innovations to cook with 2.5 to 4 plus times less electricity than induction cooktops. What about industry, which uses half the world's energy and electricity? Well, RMI's latest $60 plus billion dollars worth of industrial redesigns typically found about 30 to 60 percent energy savings on retrofit, paying back in a few years and far outperforming the orange zone in the upper left, where most energy service companies deliver disintegrated design. In new industrial projects, Integrative design generally yielded 40 to 90 plus percent energy savings with lower than normal capital cost, often just by paying attention to important basic systems. For example, most electricity runs motors. Half the motor power runs pumps and fans. Just better pipe and duct design can save 80 to 90 plus percent of the friction and therefore of the pump and fan power. If everyone did this, this redesign could save about a fifth of the world's electricity, or half the coal-fired electricity, 
uh, and the paybacks are typically under a year in retrofit and instant in new build. Yet this isn't in any standard engineering textbook, official study, industry forecast, or climate model. Why not? Because it's not a technology. It's a design method. And few people yet think of design as a way to scale rapid change. We need to use big pipes and small pumps, not small pipes and big pumps. Notice also that the tiny pump at the right is raised up to meet the pipe rather than dipping the pipe down to the floor and back up again with four right angle bends. And to eliminate those elbows and their friction, we stagger the 10 chillers, which used to be in a neat row, by laying out the pipes first, then the equipment. We bend mines, not pipes. In the Oakland Museum, Peter Rumsey, a longtime colleague of mine and advisor to emphasis, retrofitted an efficient piping layout into one of the pumping loops, cutting the pumping energy by three-fourths and recovering the investment in two or three months. And it also eliminated 15 pumps that will never again waste energy and maintenance costs. Repiping the other pumping loop and adding variable frequency drives doubled the flow and saved 85% of the energy. Uh, to help the pipe fitters understand how to minimize friction, Peter simply asked them to lay out the supply pipes as if they were drains. Here's how most big buildings pipe the cooling tower water back to the chiller's condenser. But if we lay it out instead the way Peter does, everything gets better. The only obstacle is force of habit. And now think of the whole power and pumping system. From the fuel burnt in the thermal power plant at the upper left to the end use, many successive losses compound. So only a tenth of the energy in the fuel comes out the pipe as flow. But now turn those compounding losses round backwards into compounding savings from right to left, and every unit of flow or friction you save in the pipe saves 10 units of fuel cost emissions and global weirding at the power station. And as you go back upstream, the components get smaller and cheaper, so the total capital cost goes down. And of course, once your pump or fan needs five or 10 times less power to drive it, replacing the big inefficient motor system with a new right size super efficient one can save around half the remaining energy by making 35 integrated improvements, of which 28 are free byproducts of the first seven. And then you save twice as much drive system energy as the usual package of two disintegrated measures, and at a fifth the cost per unit. Motors are India's biggest user of electricity, and efficiency standards are generations behind, as they are also in the US, by the way, so the opportunity is especially large. Well, now let's apply the same logic to, let's say, a big old data center. Two-thirds of the fuel fed into the power station is lost in the plant and the grid. Half the metered electricity is then lost in the cooling system at the data center and its uninterruptible power supplies. Together, that's half the total capital cost before it even gets to the servers. Then half the server energy doesn't reach the chips because it's lost in inefficient, usually very underloaded power supplies and lots of superfluous fans. Next comes severe underutilization of computing resources, partly through insufficient virtualization. So there are zombie servers whose application hasn't run for years, or, or we have only one application on a server instead of many. Now, the resulting energy flow, the tiny yellow stalk at the very bottom right, is about to vanish, so let's magnify it before we lose it. Next comes bloatware running many unnecessary threads and processes and making simple tasks very complex because compute cycles were cheaper than programmers' attention and someone else paid the energy bill. And then downstream of all that, you may even have inefficient business processes. So in all, the red numbers across the bottom reveal that just a few hundred thousandths of the original fuel energy is actually delivering customer value. Where should we start fixing this? downstream. First, write elegantly terse code, optimally compiled, with the goal that every compute cycle is a needed and wanted one. I had assumed this would save roughly an order of magnitude, a factor 10, in compute cycles, but recent tests suggest it's two orders of magnitude, roughly a hundredfold, and now that we're all on mobile devices, that makes efficient code valuably stretch battery life. 
Well, then we can at least quadruple server efficiency, now even more, and the servers will need much less cooling and power supply, both of which can be done in smarter ways. And then we could even save half the utility losses by using fuel cell tri-generation at lower capital cost. So if you multiply those savings from downstream to upstream, you're cutting the energy use by at least two orders of magnitude, roughly a hundredfold. And the actual project for which we made this diagram, uh, let's see, 14 years ago, the client rejected most of our recommendations, so we were only able to treble efficiency at the same capital cost. Very disappointing. But our partner EDS said that had our recommendations, which they agreed with, all been adopted, we would have saved about 95% of the energy and half the capital cost. I've noticed that the emphasis data centers are more efficient than many in India's hot, wet climates. The cooling and other support equipment are using 31 to 122 percent as much electricity as the servers. The global average is 80 percent. The state of the art is 5 percent. Uh, this seems worth discussing. Now, another big industrial opportunity is saving the energy intensive materials that industry makes. A couple of papers two years ago compiled convincing literature on how smarter structural design can profitably save at least half the world's cement and steel that now release 15% of global CO2. For example, substituting tension for compression structures typically looks better, costs less, and uses one-eighth the tons. Pouring concrete into curvy fabric forms, not rigid prismatic forms, can often save over half the concrete by putting strength and stiffness only where you need them. And then the weight savings compound, they multiply because you need less strength to hold up less weight. An airy 3D printed bridge can mainly carry its users while massive concrete bridges support mainly their own weight. This beautiful stainless steel bridge is 3D printed. Most importantly, floor slabs, which we don't think about, we just walk on them, are about half the total weight of a typical mid- or high-rise building. A five centimeter thick folded concrete floor slab like corrugated cardboard or a shallow vaulted dome replaces a 30 centimeter thick flat slab, but it costs less and saves three-fourths of the cement and all of the steel. Material suppliers, rather than selling tons, could use new business models to lease structural services so the fewer tons are needed, the more profit they and their customers both make. And once you've got a thin slab, then a new building can save a further roughly 15% of those core structural materials and three-fourths of the energy use, whilst increasing net rentable space by a stunning 55%. How? Well, look at the left illustration. You design out that vertical meter or so of mechanical plenum at each story, and that lets three stories with a normal 2.8 meter ceiling height fit in the vertical space that we now use for two stories, as in the Singapore building at the upper right. Cost, complexity, and time all fall dramatically. Everything gets better. What about transport? Well, another example is doubling or trebling automotive efficiency before electrification because most of the energy needed to move a car is caused by its weight. And even at 2013 prices for the rather dear and very strong and light material carbon fiber, BMW showed how integrative design can take 300 kilos of weight out of the car at competitive cost. This i3 model that I drive reportedly made money from the first unit off the assembly line. Its carbon fiber was paid for by the batteries that its lightness saved. And fewer batteries mean faster recharging with less electricity, less infrastructure, lower emissions, less investment. This car's integrative design uh, snowballed or multiplied saved weight far more than usually assumed. Its manufacturing was radically frugal, confirming the elimination of the two hardest steps in making the car and it's much better for the workers. <clears throat> its efficiency is quadrupled without compromise to the equivalent of 53 kilometers per liter and with many driver advantages like half the normal turn radius. 
Next, two electric hypercars, both from little firms I advise, are ready to enter the market as soon as they finish raising production capital. They're two or three times more efficient than even a Tesla. So the uh, solar cells on top of the car capture enough energy to power normal driving without plugging in. Tesla's semi-electric heavy lorry roughly triples efficiency. This quiet, omnifueled diesel air taxi with more than an 8,000 kilometer range has one-eighth the operating cost and fuel use of a business jet. It can scale up, probably to about 737 size, and the aviation opportunities for efficiency co-evolve with mutually supporting ones in automotive innovation. For example, Denso's best aviation motor produces 25 kilowatts of shaft power per kilogram. That's about five or ten times uh, what a standard electric vehicle motor does. Aircraft can also become far lighter. Three decades ago, a young engineer at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works led the design of a 95% carbon composite advanced tactical fighter airframe that was one-third lighter but two-thirds cheaper than the 72% metal base model for what's now called the Joint Strike Fighter. But soon airframes can get 98% lighter than today's by covering a molded plastic cellular lattice with a tough polymer skin. And like a bird's wing, its whole shape can morph passively and continuously to cut drag and boost lift and saved energy. The implications for cost, aerodynamics, hence endurance and range are revolutionary. Add up hundreds of powerful examples across the whole economy, as my Stanford course does, and you find that integrative design, if fully applied, could raise global energy productivity by about fivefold. And in India, I dare say, by more, even more. Now, 12 years ago, 60 colleagues and I at RMI showed how by 2050, at a historically reasonable pace, trebled or quadrupled energy efficiency in US buildings, which use three-fourths of our electricity, and doubled energy efficiency in industry could very profitably shrink electricity use by one-fourth despite all electric automobiles and a 2.6-fold bigger GDP. This quadrupled efficiency of using electricity would cost a tenth as much per unit as the electricity it saves. So our analysis didn't buy nearly enough efficiency. And that's before we knew about structural design efficiency or new production processes such as a method of electrochemical iron making devised by an Indian entrepreneur that runs at 60 degrees, not 1600 degrees. Well, <clears throat> in that analysis that showed the quadrupled electric efficiency in the business and design book, Reinventing Fire, we also showed how to treble total US energy efficiency and quintuple renewable supply by 2050. So we could get to a two degree climate target, $5 trillion cheaper, all led by business for profit. And the first 12 years of that 40-year <coughs> journey are pretty well on track, green actual versus blue proposed, I think largely because the private sector smells the $5 trillion on the table. That's exactly what should be happening. Our book's translation inspired China's counterpart of Niti Aog, the NDRC, to lead a rigorous 2017 government study <coughs> showing how to cut carbon intensity by a factor 13. Its advisory committee became the energy authors of the 11th five-year, sorry, the uh, 13th five-year plan, and it was adopted and expanded and remains ahead of schedule now in the 14th plan. China is the world's fastest nation in deploying efficiency and renewables, and it has a big head start, but India is accelerating and has some special leapfrog opportunities. Let me give a few examples. This 27 watt electric household, even including a 56 centimeter color television, uh, runs entirely on a solar panel, one third smaller than the one in the picture, and that cuts the total investment in half. More broadly, if you invest things, if you invest to make things that save electricity, not to supply more, you need about a thousand times less capital and you recover it about 10 times faster. So you need about 10,000 times less capital 
for the most capital-intensive sector, electricity, which devours a fourth of global development capital. Freeing up that capital to fund other development needs is the biggest macroeconomic lever we know for fair global development. Think what this could do in India. To free the girls in those <coughs> uh, families in more impoverished rural areas from gathering wood and dung for cooking, uh, smarter pots could be at least as important as better cook stoves and perhaps culturally easier, although they're uh, not very much on the agenda. Many of these proven improvements in pots are on the market separately. They could be combined and adapted by local metal smiths to local skills and needs. They could be designed cleanably and durably and integrated with the stoves. And if you put all the options together for efficient cooking, you may need a tenth or less as much cooking energy even before applying solar power or solar heat. Here's the big one. Six years ago, Indian agriculture was using about 90% of the water withdrawals and $10 billion a year in subsidies. The 1.8 crore electric irrigation pumps used 19% of the nation's electricity. Officially, they had a connected load of 100 gigawatts. It might actually have been 150. Those pumps are generally inefficient, poorly controlled. They run on free or subsidized power to deliver water, two-thirds pumped from groundwater, and then mostly wait wasted. Well, among 9.3 crore smallholders at the time growing over half of farm output, even the ones on the grid are often power deprived. Mainly intermittent power limits them to low value crops and nighttime power makes farming dangerous, cobras and so on. Inefficient irrigation strains grid capacity. It limits new connections, it encourages and is worsened by theft, and it starves the discomps for revenue. Diesel pumping is even worse, devouring 60% of farm income and $3 billion a year in foreign exchange whilst limiting farmers' profits. Well, some Indian entrepreneurs offer a compelling value proposition, sometimes integrated with more than four lock telecom towers, and some new business models start by doubling or trebling motor and pump system efficiencies, dispatching demand response and surplus power back to the grid. <coughs> Over time, this can cut in half the cost of serving agricultural customers. So then the DISCOM can reinvest in greater access and in more connections. The state saves half its cost. The farmer needn't contribute, but pays a rational tariff, maybe four rupees or so, for actual usage. The developer invests the capital in the pumping and control infrastructure and the solar cells, and the grid's better utilized. But even more cost could be saved by reducing pipe friction, as we've seen. By bundling solar pumping with drip irrigation, still at under 5%, I think, of Indian irrigation, almost all at 10 times the pressure that smallholders actually need. Drip can also shrink the, the solar system to irrigate a hectare from groundwater in, in suction range from 2 kilowatts down to 600 watts, probably even 400 watts for a one-year system payback. And even more water can be saved uh, <clears throat> with cheap root zone moisture controls that measure and supply just the water the plant needs. So the electricity to crop efficiency potential is probably over twice the 37 uh, percent best case official estimate of improvement. And if farmers diversify from say wheat to high value off-season fruits, spices, vegetables, and even add more value like say distilling mint oil instead of selling mint leaves, their profits can rise hugely, but even with standard crops, some practitioners of radical efficiency six years ago could offer smallholders a two-year payback, and by now it's probably about a one-year payback, and it can pay for the whole system by immediately quintupling the yield of associated fish ponds. Perhaps a government revolving fund could progressively substitute such systems financing for existing irrigation energy subsidies and solve all these problems at once. All proven ingredients, uh, some assembly required. Now, the other great energy revolution is in renewable supply. For 82% of global power generation, unsubsidized renewables, solar in yellow, wind in blue, have become the least cost source of new bulk electricity. And some of the world's cheapest solar power wins in India. Bloomberg New Energy Finance 
found the cheapest way to meet a flat load is now solar or wind power plus backup, which can be demand side, storage, renewable, or fueled. And Putin's war makes avoiding volatile fuel fuel, fossil fuel prices even more valuable. And while costs are flat for fossil fuel power and rising for nuclear, they keep falling for renewables and storage. So they're rapidly accelerating in world markets. Bloomberg just raised its forecast of global solar additions during this year by 44% during the past year. That's how fast things are moving. China is now expected to install <coughs> uh, over half of that, 209 gigawatts of solar this year. That's nearly twice what they installed last year. Solar power this year is getting more investment than drilling for oil worldwide. And distributed renewables, the decentralized ones, can also be installed extremely quickly by millions of self-interested market actors. Coal-dependent Vietnam at the end of 2008 had 0.1 gigawatts of solar power. Two years later, it had 16.5 gigawatts, the most in East Asia, a third more than the target they'd set months before for five years later, enough to generate a fourth of the nation's electricity once the grid patches up. And nine of that 16 gigawatts uh, was on 100,000 rooftops or similar improvised structures equivalent in output to building half the nation's coal plants in one year. By the way, 72% of those were installed just in the month of December, mostly in the last week of December, before a nine-month window closed for a juicy feed-in tariff, and nearly all the projects were privately financed. Amazing what you can do when smart, hard-working, resourceful people get good policy. Now, this transition is manageable because we have not just one way, bulk storage in Magenta, but about 10 carbon-free ways to make the grid flexible, reliable, and renewable. I've sketched them here in approximate order of increasing cost. Your actual costs will vary, but bulk storage comes last, not first. So we needn't wait for a storage miracle, though some are emerging, and the market isn't waiting. The two boxes at the far left, flexiwatts, megawatts, are both several fold larger than we thought a few years ago. As an illustration of others, uh, integrating electric cars with the grid could be another very important grid balancer. You know, in Amsterdam today, you can drive your electric car to the world's greenest football stadium, plug it in to help power the stadium whilst keeping enough charge to get you home, and they let you in for free. The Mobility House uh, Swiss outfit integrates auto batteries with European grids to provide 13 of the 21 services that automotive grid integration offers, like selling frequency stability to the German grid. And two years ago, that firm was earning 1,000 euros per auto battery per year. Now, we're still often told, despite this profusion of options, that we need fossil and nuclear plants to keep the lights on because wind and solar power are variable and thus supposedly unreliable. But variable doesn't mean unpredictable. Here's how accurately the French grid operator in one stormy winter month forecast a day ahead the actual output of the nation's wind farms. I'll bet they wish they could forecast demand that accurately. And now the East Danish wind operators a decade later can bid wind power into the day ahead hourly auctions, just like fossil fuel capacity, because it's even more reliable thanks to the good forecasting. Indeed, we built the grid because no generator is 24-7. They all break. And when a giant plant fails, you lose a billion watts in milliseconds, often abruptly, often for weeks or months. Grids were built to manage this intermittence by backing up failed plants with working plants. And in exactly the same way, but at often lower cost, grids can manage the forecastable variations of solar and wind power by backing up those variable renewables with a portfolio of other renewables, all forecasted, integrated, and diversified by type and location. So in the big, hot, often humid state of Texas, whose grid has no big hydro dams and is only 1% connected to the rest of the United States, a 2050 summer week of expected load, as forecast years ago, can get much smaller and less peaky with efficient use. Then we can make 86% of that annual electricity with wind and solar power, they're quite variable. And the other 14% from dispatchable renewables, the ones you can have whenever you want, 
like geothermal, small hydro, solar thermoelectric, burning ag and municipal and industrial wastes, burning feedlot gas and existing gas turbines, burning obsolete energy studies. Um, so this 100% renewable supply can then match the load, the dashed line, by putting surplus electricity into two kinds of distributed storage that are worth buying anyhow, high storage air conditioning and smart charging of electric autos, and then recovering that energy when needed and filling the last gaps with unobtrusively flexible demand. Only about 5% of the annual renewable output is then left over to help decarbonize other sectors, so the economics should be excellent even at today's prices. Some grid operators already do such choreography routinely. In a whole recent year, Germany, Britain, Ireland were about half renewably powered, Denmark 84%, Scotland 99%, Spain 46%, Portugal 66%, way out on the end of the European grid, all without adding storage and with superior reliability. So these operators have learned to run their grids the way a conductor leads the symphony orchestra. No instrument plays all the time, but the ensemble continuously creates beautiful music. Now the same ultra-reliable German grid operator and its Belgian counterpart <coughs> that are 99.999% reliable today with 62% renewables, soon 100, they just analyzed Europe's long, calm, cloudy periods. Uh, called the Dunkelflaute. <clears throat> and these dark doldrums turn out to need backup power for only up to one or two weeks a year, totaling about 6% of winter electricity use. Just using existing gas-fired capacity, burning green molecules like hydrogen or ammonia that were made at other times from surplus solar and wind. And the often claimed need for months or seasons of storage was not found, partly because this study included moderately efficient use, electric vehicle integration, heat pumps behind the meter home batteries, and demand response that they found by itself could cut renewable powers under or over supply days by 90%. Well, to be sure, German engineers are very good, but so are Indian engineers. Likewise, the U.S. National Renewable Energy Lab competing efficiency against storage conservatively found that making U.S. buildings more efficient can reduce investments by about tenfold. In fact, in the region with the climate most like southern India, by 97%, by displacing long-duration hydrogen storage and the green electricity needed to make it. Just a fortnight ago, a major U.S. government study found that aggressively decarbonizing buildings could save $100 billion each year in electricity supply costs. That's a third of the total cost of decarbonizing the U.S. grid. Lastly, I want to share with you an important recent Oxford study that used empirical data in a deliberately simple and transparent model to examine three global scenarios for the energy transition. Just let's look at the nine graphs and not worry about the fine print. From left to right, the first column shows a fast transition that gets the world off fossil fuels by about 2040. The middle column shows a slow transition that rapidly suppresses renewable growth, so fossil fuels dominate still by mid-century. And then there's a worst case, no transition on the right uh, that simply scales current market shares. Now the top row of graph shows the energy services delivered or useful energy. The second shows final energy. The bottom row is about electricity. It shows in light aqua the electricity used in sectors already electrified. The uh, dark aqua shows the electricity that makes grid fuels to back up the grid, and the dark blue shows the electricity that makes green fuels to decarbonize heavy trans transport and industrial heat. And then the dashed magenta curve shows how much storage capacity it would take to run the grid for a month with no solar or wind. That's far more than we need. Now, importantly, none of these scenarios includes any acceleration in energy or materials efficiency, which of course could mean less supply and less cost. Nonetheless, and contrary to widespread claims and assumptions, the fast transition, the first column, is many-fold cheaper than the slow one or than no transition. 
and the faster it goes, the cheaper it gets, because renewables get cheaper even sooner. Significant stranded assets can be largely or wholly avoided. That's because depreciation plus growth in service demand adds up to about 4 to 6 percent a year, and many of the assets are already old. So the standard assumption that a clean energy transition will cost more than what we're doing now, business as usual, turns out to be wrong. And what we should do no longer depends on the assumed discount rate, time value of money, as scholastic analysts have been insisting for decades. So climate policy turns out to have spent decades focusing on supposed economic trade-offs that do not actually exist. And the authors dryly conclude, updating expectations to better align with historical evidence could fundamentally change the debate about climate policy and dramatically accelerate progress to decarbonize energy systems around the world. So in sum, we're not short of climate mitigation methods. We're short of deployment and discernment. Drowning in energy innovations, we cling to the familiar while overlooking many better solutions, probably totaling more than we need and more than we can afford. And I haven't even mentioned here important biological climate change mitigations. So we're now entering the tricky phase of distinguishing useful and competitive innovations from pre-stranded assets with a slick sales pitch. As our models improve and our vision clears, I suspect that the standard projections of the need for electricity, hydrogen, and investment to mitigate climate change may prove grossly exaggerated. But India's immensely deep talent pool and its bold entrepreneurship and high ambition could give it a global advantage. Our friends of the independent RMI India organization, led by Akshmagate, uh, <clears throat> in collaboration with the global CEO of RMI, uh, John Kreitz, uh, are privileged, as am I, to help the government of India, state and municipal governments, and the private sector to speed India's gratifying energy transition. I hope you will find this work helpful and will help us improve it. And I want to thank you all for your good work and your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Amari. That was uh, wonderful and also very uplifting because you're basically saying we, we can solve this problem. Uh, I, but it appears to me that Many people, when they think of solving this problem, think of global, uh, you know, Paris Convention and deals and trillions of dollars going from here to there and all that. But you're saying it's just coming from just better design and better mental models of what the future will look like? It's a combination of innovative design, technology we've already got, new business models and strategies, better public policy, entrepreneurship, and some would say behavioral change. Uh, this is a very potent combination. And the Vietnam uh, example, I think, shows that millions of market actors can move faster than big specialized institutions. But, but uh, is there something in public policy that can accelerate? I mean, like a carbon tax or something. Is there something you can do at a macro level that accelerate this innovation happening? Yeah, several things. Um, one of the most powerful would be to desubsidize the entire energy sector. This can be politically difficult, uh, both because uh, one needs to uh, enable poor people to afford enough energy for a decent life, but subsidies may not be the best way to do that. Uh, and uh, because some very powerful incumbents get big subsidies, much bigger, uh, and also, of course, they like the money they're making. They normally earn about $2 trillion a year in rents to the fossil fuel owners or industries. And last year with Putin's war, that went up to $3.5 trillion. So they're reluctant to give that up. But uh, besides desubsidization, let me suggest a couple of policies that could be very helpful. One would be to reward uh, any regulated energy providers of, say, electricity or gas uh, for cutting your bill, not for selling you more energy. 
many countries have this long, wrong way around, but there are some simple reforms uh, that align incentives between providers and customers. And that's very powerful. But, but if the bill is less, how does the utility make more money? Oh, well, if, okay, the, the problem arises when a regulator projects how much energy the company is going to sell next year and figures out how much money it needs to get a fair return on and of its capital used and useful in the business, and then they add on the pass-through of the operating costs. Trouble is then, if the provider sells more energy than forecast, their profits go up. If they sell less, their profits go down. But this means that they're vulnerable to shifts in business conditions or weather that they cannot control. Uh, they have an incentive to understate the forecast and overfulfill the norm. Uh, and lawyers spend a lot of time arguing about what, what's the right forecast. So the reform is called decoupling and shared savings. Uh, so if in a given year the utility sells more energy than had been forecast, the extra profits from that extra sale don't go to the company. They go in the bank in an escrow account. If in another year they sell less than expected, you take the money out of the bank and make them whole. And then if they do anything clever to cut your bill, including helping you use energy more efficiently, you let them keep some, maybe a tenth of the saving as extra profit. That's the shared savings part. So in, say, 1992, our biggest U.S. shareholder-owned utility invested $170 million to help customers save energy cheaper than it could be produced, even in existing plants. The regulator gave 89% of the saving to the customers as lower bills and 11% to the shareholders as higher profits. One of my predecessors as, as chairman of RMI uh, read that program and he reported that the chief executive would ring him every week and say, is there anything you need? And all the cleverest people in the company would want to come work in the efficiency department to advance their careers. So when you align provider and customer incentives, it completely changes corporate culture and behavior. And the other most important uh, policy I've run across uh, is called uh, fee baits, which I mentioned briefly for building buildings. But suppose you were going to buy a car. Uh, well, if you get a very efficient new car, you get a rebate. If you buy a less efficient than normal car, you pay a fee. The fees can pay for the rebates. You can make it size neutral, revenue neutral. Uh, but the practical effect of this is that the car buyer can apply a very low societal discount rate to the private purchase. Uh, and that's a, a very powerful change in what economic signals we see. This is fairly widely used in some European countries. And in France, uh, they've actually engineered it so that uh, the fee bait makes, it, which is called a bonus malus system, makes a new Renault electric car free to the purchaser. Now, I, I think more generally, where I would hope policymakers would pay more attention is not only in getting prices right and removing other fiscal distortions, uh, but also in what we call barrier busting. There are 60 or 80 market failures in buying energy efficiency. They come in about eight categories. Uh, there are many of them. They're complicated. Each of them has a solution. That is, each stumbling block can be turned into a stepping stone. Caution, however, this often requires meticulous attention to detail and relentless patience. Because, for example, in the commercial property market, there are about two dozen parties in the value chain, and they each, with stunning perfection, are penalized for efficiency, rewarded for inefficiency. They hardly talk to each other. They speak different languages, use different metrics. And if you were to try to devise a complex system of habits and structures and rewards to make sure that buildings use 10 times the energy they should do and are less uh, comfortable and healthful and productive to be in than they should be and cost more to build than they should do, you'd be hard pressed to improve on the system we've got. So each of these two dozen parties 
is a business opportunity, but leaving one out can be a showstopper. Okay, there are three uh, things you said which are against uh, conventional wisdom in some sense. So I, I wanted to get only to three. I mean, there are many more, but <laughs> three that I caught. I'm not <laughs> smart enough to catch the other seven. Uh, the first is that a lot of people believe that new types of nuclear power using these modular reactors could be a good way of tackling it, but you don't agree with that. No, it's vaporware. Vaporware? Uh, yeah, uh, okay. they don't actually exist. Most of them are well, actually... A couple of them going online now, I thought? No. No, no way? No. <laughs> uh, they're mostly old designs from the 50s, and they were abandoned for good reasons. But the broader context here is that they are quite similar in important respects to the big old kinds of reactors uh, that uh, are dying of an incurable attack of market forces because they produce electricity at many times the cost of solar or wind or efficiency. Uh, and that means they're actually worse for climate change. Why is that? Well, because we're trying to displace fossil fuel. And if we buy a costly way to do that, that is more rupees per kilowatt hour, we're going to displace less fossil fuel per rupee than if we bought cheaper options like renewables and efficiency. Cheaper means you get more of the clean resource per rupee, so you displace more fossil fuel. And by the way, nuclear is also a lot slower to deploy, even in the okay, new Okay, so types. in your book, nuclear not required? Okay. Nuclear not only required, actually an obstacle to running the grid okay. in a uh, reliable and economic way. Okay. And uh, by the way, for that reason, because investors, if not governments, have figured this out, uh, nuclear adds as much output every year worldwide uh, as, uh, as renewables add every couple of days. Okay, so nuclear is out. Yeah. Second thing is, you know, a lot of people believe that green hydrogen is a big thing, especially for steel and cement and all that. And some estimates are showing up to 10% of the new sort of energy co combination will be uh, green hydrogen. But you don't believe that, do you? Well, I think it's important uh, for those uh, harder to abate heavy industries and long distance air travel and so on. And before that, probably for things like fertilizer. Uh, ammonia. Yeah, ammonia, make ammonia. Exactly. Uh, <clears throat> but there's a fairly widespread misunderstanding about it that I, th I think Armai India understands well, but, but some outfits don't. That is, think about the energy world in two silos. One is people who worry about the electric grid and aren't perhaps looking hard enough at all 10 ways to keep it reliable as it becomes renewable. And they think we're going to need a lot of green hydrogen and ammonia to uh, back up the grid at times when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Meanwhile, there's another group of people who run things like cement and steel mills. They say we're going to need a lot of green hydrogen to displace the fossil fuel we now use to make that high temperature heat. And they don't realize that they're double counting. They, they're really talking about the same uh, renewable capacity because you overbuild it on the grid side in order to cope with normal fluctuations in weather, and you can afford to do that readily because they're very cheap. But that means that most of the time they're not being called upon to do that, but there's still sun and wind providing more renewable electricity than you need. So that's when you make the hydrogen or an ammonia from that capacity and then sell it to those guys at just below the price of the fossil fuel. So this is a very good business. So, but it'll be much still a much smaller than what people expect. Well, I think it may be smaller, partly because <coughs> of <coughs> the kind of innovation I mentioned with the Indian entrepreneur who's, who can, he believes, make iron at 60 degrees, not 1600 degrees. Wow. So that would probably, if so, we'll know within months, displace a lot of the green hydrogen that was going to go to so steel mills. Lower the heat requirement of these products like steel and cement than you'll do with electricity well, and not with yes, hydrogen. And also, okay. for example, uh, China's strategy for lightweighting cars uh, says that by 2030 their flagship, not their average, but their flagship cars will be made of carbon fiber like the BMW one I showed and that will use four-fifths less steel. Okay. And then so you think steel they, itself will come down. Yeah, and they are so dominant 
in the, that to in the, in, of TCA. in the auto industry, and you know batteries are still the costliest thing in the car, and you need fewer of them if it's lighter. That uh, that could in turn uh, be the tipping point for the global auto industry to shift materials. Well, the third thing you implying is that you don't need a traditional steady base load in this new world because what people believe is that if you have so much wind and so much electricity both these are intermittent because you know solar only comes when there is sun if there's no sun there's no energy wind only comes when it's blowing and therefore to offset that volatility of those two sources you need a base load of some kind you don't believe in that well the principle made perfect sense for the past century or so and the principle was that you would operate most the plants that cost the least to run. That's the principle of economic dispatch. Uh, and that meant that since the plants that were cheapest to run, aside from some big old hydro dams, were uh, mainly coal plants and uh, possibly some nuclear plants, you would run those as much as you could. And then you'd run variably some gas plants uh, for the varying load, and then a little bit, you'd run the very dear uh, gas turbines just for the peak. Well, what what's now quietly turned upside down is that the big fossil and nuclear plants are uneconomic to run because just their operating cost is greater than the cost of building and operating a solar or wind plant, let alone uh, electric efficiency and demand response, those are even cheaper. Night, what do you do at night? There's no, no sun and the wind is still. What do you do then? Well, the, the wind is usually not still at night in, in all places. Uh, I mean, maybe we're asleep and we don't notice, but, but actually these resources are quite complementary during day and night and also okay. uh, in times of year. Uh, and that's, that's why that, that combination plus the other bits of renewables you can have whenever you want actually do make quite a reliable supply. That's how the European countries I mentioned sure. are keeping their But that also requires another kind of renewable, which is more steady state uh, production. Yeah. So what we're now heading into is a world that is not base load, but base cost, where you run renewables whenever they're available because they cost practically nothing to run. And then you, you run other resources only to follow the net load resulting from their operation. And that actually puts a, uh, a disadvantage on inflexible technologies like nuclear. And I guess the, the other part of the fallacy in the worldview you describe is it turns out that the baseload plants are not all that reliable. They're typically down about 10 or 15% of the time. Okay. Yeah. They themselves are not reliable. Okay, last point. I get the sense that you don't think we need grid storage because millions of car batteries will do the job. There may be cases where we need grid storage, and it's certainly a resource that should compete against all others. But if, of course, you go to a battery meeting, the conversation is all about my battery is better than your battery, and no one likes to talk about what all batteries have to compete with, which is the other nine <laughs> carbon-free ways of, of um, stabilizing the grid. So. Uh, my, my impression so far is that in, in the places we've looked at, uh, you never get as far up the supply curve as you would have to do at present prices to justify massive grid storage. Now that said, they are extremely successful giant batteries in, from Tesla and others in places like South Australia, and they are providing much more rapid and precise response to grid disturbances than the old rotating machine power plants ever could or did, uh, and they're very successful commercially. They charge up with cheap power or even negative price power, and then they discharge in times of scarcity when it's, when it's very dear, and they make a huge amount of money. Uh, and they sell a lot of other valuable services to stabilize the grid. However, that they are competitive and that they are, they have a, a positive benefit cost ratio, benefit exceeds cost. That does not mean that they are the cheapest way to do the job. And we simply are not, in general, allowing efficiency demand response to compete properly against all others. So 
I think back to your policy question, uh, I hope I live to see a time when all ways to save or produce electricity get to compete fairly at honest prices regardless of their type, technology, size, location, or ownership. In my country, that's about the opposite of the energy policy we have. <laughs> Great. I think we have time for a few questions. Uh, you all know the rules at BIC. You don't, the mic, mic doesn't come to you. You go to the mic. The mic is right here. And you're most welcome to come here and ask your question. If there are many of you, stand in a line. Hello, Wins. Uh, welcome to Bangalore, my hometown. Good to see you at BSC, where I'm a life member. <clears throat> and then good to see you on Earth. I keep running into you on airplanes only. One of the things that you touched on, I mean, I fully endorse what you already said. Design and uh, exit technologies can take us a long way in, in mitigating climate challenges that we face today. One of the things that you alluded to, particularly in irrigation, is the use of uh, brushless DC motors instead of the induction motors, which can save a huge amount of uh, energy as of today. And one of the things that those of them in, in contact with the policy makers can do is to bring regulation, like we did with the LED bulb situation, go for replacing irrigation pump sets with BLDC motorized pump sets. That will save two-thirds of energy as we speak. Those of you who want to come, please come to my ancestral village two and a half hours from here. I have done it. Please come and see the thing and we can demonstrate. The BLDC motors also is very important for all the fans and air conditioners and all these things that are... Anybody heard of Attenberg? Attenberg fans? Yes. Attenberg fans available today, so this is already available. Great. Regulatory things is needed. Okay. And things like, yeah, thank um, you so yeah. much. Uh, this, and uh, that's a, an important class, and there are others of very efficient, speed controllable motors. Uh, but notice that if you then combine that with efficient irrigation technique, that includes 10 times less pressure, which is 10 times less pumping power, uh, and Paul Pollock developed that and tested it in several states of India, just laying a flat tube on the ground, uh, and it has slots in it to let the water out. And it's much cheaper than the more durable, uh, but not as cost effective, uh, buried fancy drip irrigation. Okay, I think we have time just for uh, three questions. So we have three people standing here. So why don't you ask the question? Good evening. Uh, so Incidentally, I'd worked at Con Edison when they were doing an experiment on uh, demand response for the ACs in New York. Uh, but how do you, ex how do, you, how does the government, like from from the top down, how do they get the motivation to develop something of this sort, say in an Indian context, where uh, you know demand response can actually be a viable viable thing? Saves money. De demand response is using is helping people use electricity timely rather than more efficiently. So you, you, you're you less likely to use it when it's uh, scarce and more likely to use it when it's abundant. And for example, one of, my, one of our electric cars has a charger that looks at the grid frequency every second and adjusts the charging rate uh, according to whether the grid is short or long electricity. So you don't have to have a smart grid to do smart things with a dumb grid. Now, the, uh, the demand response techniques usually are just about uh, pricing or about direct load control, like we'll turn off your water heater for 15 minutes and you'll never know because the hot water is stored. And those are good techniques, but there's a nice compendium of 109 experimental uh, pilot programs using them in different combinations over 14 years in three continents. And it turned out that the uh, commonly used ones are not terribly effective, but the, some that are less commonly used, especially combining pricing and technology and information, can save 30 to 50 percent or more of the peak load. And that's a fantastic Great. benefit to the grid. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Thanks for being here. Um, what do you think of the notion, a lot of people make this case, that we cannot innovate our way out of the crisis if we only focus on avoidance and there's no way to meet the net zero goals unless we invest in carbon removal and things like enhanced rock weathering and biochar, et cetera. Biochar has, has some attractive features, but in general, 
Uh, you remember my very opening remark about how the, the climate choice and consequence models are very conservatively understate what you can do to combat climate change, just as the climate science models are conservative in, in counting the speed and runaway potential of climate change. Well, <clears throat> the, um, the, the, the reason that most conventional models say we need carbon sequestration and storage or direct removal of carbon from the air is that they're not properly competing or comparing those and all other ways to protect the climate, particularly energy efficiency. If, and, and those that, that count renewables, as most do, almost always greatly overstate the cost of those renewables, often by three to five-fold or more, rather than using the actually ex observed market prices. This might seem bizarre, but it seems that many modelers prefer to use economic theory rather than actually looking up the quoted price in the marketplace. Uh, and there's a good literature on this now, uh, including the Oxford study I mentioned, showing uh, dramatically lower prices in the market than in the models. And the reason is, is mainly that the models do not, mo do not simulate the feedback between demand and price uh, within the model. They do it outside. And therefore, it doesn't allow to operate the actual feedback loop that says, uh, we buy renewables because they're cheap, and then we buy, because they're cheap, we buy more, and then they get cheaper. Uh, so that basic defect needs to be fixed, and we need to make all uh, uh, climate protecting resources get competed or compared rather than jumping to the costliest and least effective ones because we think we need them. We usually don't need them if we take the others seriously. Right. Thank you. Okay, last question, and then we have to stop. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Um, you know, it seems that there are enough uh, engineering solutions for uh, reducing the consumption of energy. But if you look at the public discourse, it is all about having more generation of energy because it benefits the government, it benefits the utility, and it benefits uh, uh, the people who are building the infrastructure. So where do you think this conversation should come from? Unfortunately, it did not even come during the Ukraine war when whole Europe was struggling for energy, right? They actually replaced gas with coal, not necessarily conservation. So where this... Uh, actually, actually not. Uh, it, that was a very transient short-term effect, uh, and Europe's commitment was very strongly to efficiency of renewables, and now on that basis, their gas price is below where it was, their storage is brimming over, uh, and the coal burn is, is generally decreasing sharply. Yeah, but we don't see any conversation like that in India. So where it should come from? Uh, civic society, that is what you think? Because nobody seems to be interested otherwise. Well, <laughs> I, I, I would have to defer to my colleagues in RMI India who, who work on such uh, issues with government of India and, and states and cities. Uh, but I think uh, the perhaps what's needed is an Indian analogy to what I call the inside-out utility concept. Uh, traditional utilities in the West uh, forecast demand, total demand, build to meet it, build grids to deliver it, and send you a bill. Uh, now, of course, the structure is somewhat different in India, but I think it might still work to start at the other end by asking where are we about to strengthen the distribution system where most of our investment cost is, or possibly the transmission system, and in that region, in that even neighborhood for distribution, what are the sources of peak load? We have so much commercial lighting, so much residential water heating, and so on. Let us focus our efficiency and demand response efforts on those uses in that place in order to defer or avoid 
the investment in the wires. Well, this has been tried now in three big North American utility cases, and they've saved about 90% of their investment, and they never had to increase supply uh, because the, the uh, demand side solutions turned out to be quite adequate. But this is culturally difficult because, of course, the powerful people in the utility tend to be the ones that planned and built the uh, gigantic generating projects. Uh, so it's a, it's a leadership and cultural challenge rather than an economic, technical, or financial one. And that doesn't make it easy, but the rewards are immense because this, uh, this sector is headed for trouble if it keeps investing too much in supply and has to raise the price and that further stimulates savings and then you can get into a death spiral of rising price and falling demand uh, as Australia is flirting with. So that it's, a, it's a complex issue but I, I think the, the economic uh, logic is much the same in both countries. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much Amri and thank you for a wonderful speech. The Girish Kanar New India Foundation lecture. I think we're all feeling a little more cheerful that we're going to fix this problem. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day.